And he told them a parable, reminding them that they should always pray and not lose heart. I speak to you in the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. And he told them a parable, reminding them that they should always pray and not lose heart. What a friend we have in Jesus. <coughs> All our griefs to bear all because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. In the parable of the determined widow, a poor powerless person, the widow, persists in irritating a dishonest, powerful person, the judge, to do justice for her. The parable shoulders John the Baptist's teaching that holding a position of control and management forces you to work justly, especially on behalf of the poor and weak. But here Jesus focuses the teachings in this parable using a different point that we are to pray always and not lose heart. He identifies the hearers, us, with the woman and the prayed to person, God, with the dishonest judge, a seemingly bizarre combination. Assuming that Jesus doesn't mean that God is corrupt, the point must be that if persistent pays off with a corrupt human of limited power, how much more will it pay off with a just God of infinite power? Now the purpose of the parable is to encourage Christians to persist in their faith against all odds. However, it also has two applications for those who toil in positions of management. First, the comparison of a corrupt judge with a just God implies that God's will is at work even in a corrupt world. The judge's job is to do justice and by God he will do justice by the time this persistent widow is finished with him. Elsewhere, the Bible shows that the municipal establishments serve by God's authorization, whether they acknowledge it or not. So there's optimism that even in the midst of systematic injustice, justice will be done. So let's for a few moments look at this gospel text from two points. And the first one is this. The first thing that Jesus has to say to us to encourage us not to lose heart is this. Your God is not like that and just God. Your God is not like that self-proclaimed God that unjust judge. But here's the problem. When you're hopeless, that is how you think about him. When you feel hopeless, do you think that he just doesn't care? Do you think that he's just like that unjust judge? And Jesus' whole point is to say to you in this story, your God is not like that unjust judge. And look at how he says it. Will not God give justice to his elect who cry to him day and night? But Jesus is painting a contrast. If this judge, for his own selfless reasons, will give this widow justice, will not your God, your loving Father, will he not give you justice? But here's the tricky thing. When you feel hopeless, when you have a real hard time believing that, that's when we get to a dark area. So the first thing that Jesus is teaching us in this passage is that God is more willing to hear your prayer than you are to pray it. God is more ready to answer your prayer than you are prepared to ask it. Your God is not like that unjust judge, 
and concerned about your well-being. Your God is not like that. But when you feel hopeless, when you're despairing because of the difficulty of the situation that you're in, you often have a hard time believing that. And is it not fascinating how Jesus paints a picture, a beautiful picture in the unjust judge of what you think of God when you are in that hard spot? And then he says to you, guess what? Your God is not like that. I know what some of you might be thinking in your heart. Some of us think that God is up on his throne like that. He's not interested. He's overlooked us. He's forgotten about us. But once again, that reoccurring theme, our God is not like that. You see, the first bit of good news in this passage is that your God is more willing to hear your prayer than you are to pray it. And if you are a hopeless person, then you understand how important that is. Because if you've ever lost hope, you know what it is to lose the ability to even pray. And Jesus is saying, listen to it, do you understand that your heavenly Father, he's waiting to be gracious? We just can't see it right now. I'm often reminded by our, our rector and Father Jacob and that of my sponsoring priest, Father Kevin, Kevin Andy Moore, that a Christian's, Christian leader's job is to work toward that hope at all times, that justice must be done. I'm also reminded that we cannot right every wrong in the world in our lifetimes, and although it may seem burdensome at times, we must never give up hope and never stop working for the greater good. In other words, do good unto all even in the midst of the imperfect systems where our effort occurs. The second point is that only God can bring about justice in a corrupt world. That is why we must pray and not give up in our work. God can bring miraculous justice in a corrupt world, just as God can bring miraculous healing in a sick world. And in the parable of the persistent widow, God does not intervene. The widow's faith in God and, of course, her relentless persistence leads this judge, who didn't care about anyone, leads the judge to act justly. But Jesus indicates that God is the unseen actor. Will not God grant justice for his chosen ones who cry to him day and night? But he doesn't stop there. There's another thing that he says, and the second thing that he says is, there's good news in this, in, in this story because you're not like that widow. Not only is it good news that your God is not like that judge, the good news is you are not like that widow. But we're supposed to be like that widow in persistence. In fact, when we read that passage, of, of, of the gospel story again, she is a perfect picture of persistence in prayer. She was getting no answer, and she kept pounding on the door until she got an answer. So Jesus here is picturing her positively to us as an example of persistence in what? I can't hear you. Prayer. In prayer. But there's also another important way in which you are not like that widow. You see, you're in a different position than you perceive yourself to be in when you are in the spirit. When you're without hope and you cannot even get a prayer out of your throat, you think you are in the position of that importunate widow with no resources 
and no influence. But the good news is, you're not. Do you see how Jesus teaches that in this passage? Listen to this. Look at what he says in verse 7. Will not God give justice to his elect? Jesus is saying, do you not realize who you are? You are not a widow without resources. You are the beloved of God. He has set his love on you from before the foundation of the world. Before you existed, he loved you. He loved you so much that he gave his own son, who? Jesus Christ, to die in your place. And then he not only forgave you your sins, he adopted you, he adopted me into his family and made all of us to be co-inheritors with Jesus Christ. And doesn't love you less than he loves his own son. We are his children and we are chosen. And by the way, that's what doctrine is for. Not so we can argue about it, but so when all the lights go out and we find ourselves in a dark area where we lose hope and we lose everything that seems to make sense, we still know that God loves us. And Jesus says, good news, you're not in the same position that widow was with an unjust judge. Today's gospel reminds us of, of God's love for the world. It reminds us that persistence pays off. It further reminds us that when we pray, we should pray earnestly and give it and leave it to God. But much more importantly, it reminds me and it should remind each and every one of us of God's love for mankind. That him, that, that, that him what a friend we have in Jesus should be a pivoting hymn for us, all because we do not carry everything to God in. I can't hear you. Prayer. We, we need to carry everything to God in prayer. And when we take it to God in prayer, what do we do with it? Leave it. Don't take it and pick it back up. We take it. We pray. We pray earnestly. And we have that faith that God will deal with it. We're not going to pick it back up. Here's the question. Here is Jesus' question. When I return, when I come and I bring justice with me, will I find you praying and trusting? In your trials and tribulations, when I come, will I find you believing, praying to me because you trust me? You see, the way to be ready for the coming of Christ is by faith. And faith points you away from yourself. It points you away from yourself to God's word. It points you away from yourself to God's promise. It points you away from yourself to God's son. And the reason why we do not despair in this world is not because of us. I have plenty of reasons personally to despair. And these past few weeks alone, I can give thousands upon thousands of reasons to be hopeless from within my own heart. But my hope is in the Lord, and He's why I do not despair. And so the way to be ready for His coming is what? Prayer. Good. <laughs> <laughs> the way to be ready for his coming is to trust and <coughs> or to go right back to the description of Jesus' task in verse 1. Why did Jesus tell this story? To the effect that we ought always to pray and what? Not lose heart. Some of us have lost heart. Even though we trust the Lord, we are just in a place right now where we've lost heart. Jesus doesn't want us to stay there. Jesus doesn't want us to stay there. And you know what? 
when we are down to nothing, I'm telling you, God is up to something. When we are down to nothing, God is what? Up to something. Faith sees the impossible, believes the incredible, and receives the impossible. The hope that he has purchased for us is so extensive, and the good news is, he wants each and every one of us to use it. So what do we do? Follow the word of God, and most importantly, to pray and not lose heart. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we need hope. Hope enough to go on praying. Granted to us, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.